You don't look too excited this morning. Is it well with you? Are you just find out from your neighbor whether everything is okay. Yeah. Good. Now, we'll be turning to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. I'm going to invite Pastor Grace to come and uh, take us through this scripture reading. Two stories there. Uh, and we'll be considering that this morning. Are you in 2 Kings? Are you in 2 Kings, yes or no? Yes. Chapter 4. Amen. Pastor Grace, please. Thank you. 2 Kings chapter 4, from verse 1. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing at all, she said, except a little oil. Elisha said, go, ra- go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars And as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and afterward shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Verse eight. One day, Elisha went to Shunem, and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof and put in it a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. One day, when Elisha came, he went up to his room and lay down there. He said to his servant Gehazi, call the Shunammite. So he called her and she stood before him. And Elisha said to him, tell her, you have gone to all this trouble for us. Now, what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? And she replied, I have a home among my own people. What can be done for her? Elisha asked. And Gehazi said, well, she has no son and her husband is old. Then Elisha said, call her. So he called her and she stood in the doorway. At this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she objected. Don't mislead your servant, O man of God. But the woman became pregnant. And the next year, about the same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had told her. The child grew. And one day he went out with his father, who was with the reapers. My head, my head, he cried to his father. And his father told the servant, carry him to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, and then shut the door and went out. 
She called her husband and said, Please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Verse 23. Why go to him today, he asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. It's all right, she said. She saddled the donkey and said to her servant, Lead on. Don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant Gehazi, Look, there's the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask her, Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything is all right, she said. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. And Gehazi came to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone. She is in bitter distress. But the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? She said. Didn't I tell you don't raise my hopes? Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak into your belt. Take my stuff in your hand and run. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my stuff on the boy's face. But the boy's mother said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the stuff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, The boy has not awakened. But Elisha, when Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay upon the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands, as he stretched himself out. Out upon him, the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got on the bed and stretched out upon him once more and sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite woman. And he did. And when she came, he said, Take your son. She came in fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Grace. I think we can appreciate her better than that. You've got to agree with me, that's a gift, reading the Bible like that. She makes the Bible come alive, doesn't she? You notice even the kids were so relaxed. You watch them when I start preaching, you know, then you know. <laughs> Our theme for this year, positioned for impact, scripture, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be my witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. For the past few weeks, we've just been trying to lay the foundation for this as we try to position ourselves for impact. And of course, um, this year, we are waiting on the Holy Spirit because we realize if we're going to be positioned for impact, it's only the Holy Spirit who, who can actually position us for impact. We've been talking about that. We began a study some weeks ago in the book of Joshua. Today, we are just taking a little detour as we just consider this particular story which I thought I think would be of great interest for us, especially today being a family Sunday when we have our children, I thought this would be very relevant to us because from this particular scripture, we'll still be able to learn a few things on what it means to live the spirit-filled abundant life. Remember, as we're looking at Joshua, that's what we're looking at. Now, you may look at these two stories and, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with the Holy Spirit, but I'll just show you that in just a moment. So just turn your neighbor and tell them, hold your horses, relax, you know. Wait for it. It's coming. It's coming. 
So I want to speak to us for the remaining time of this service on the topic, for those of you who like topics, a tale of two women. A tale of two women. Two stories right there that Pastor has helped us to appreciate and to read. Two stories that, of course, look a bit different, look, uh, you know, kind of uh, far apart, except a few details. And one of the details that I think makes them uh, common is the fact that Elisha, the prophet Elisha, is actually involved in both of them. But these two stories, and I really do believe that they were positioned, what we would say they were, they were they were juxtaposed against each other because of their similarities and also because of their dissimilarities. And then when you combine them together, you begin to see certain patterns and you begin to draw certain lessons. Now, just a quick overview, I think in the two stories, of course, both stories have to do with two women. You know, one woman on the first story and then the second woman, the Shunammite woman on the second story. So at least we know that uh, it revolves around these two women. It also ar revolves around the man of God, that is, prophet Elisha. Now, these two women, the first woman is a broke woman. She doesn't have anything. She's, a, she, she, she's poor. The second woman, on the other hand, is a woman of means. In fact, the Bible says that she was a great woman. I don't know what your version says. My version, especially if you're reading from the New King James Version or the King James Version, it says that she was a great woman. She was a notable woman. And the word used there in the Hebrew for notable or great, uh, basically translated, means uh, she was great in many ways, whether materially, spiritually, Character-wise, she was a great woman. She was considered to be a great woman. She was a celebrated woman. So, but we also know that materially she was doing very well. The first woman, as we begin the story, we realize that she's in trouble materially, financially, because she's dealing with creditors and she cannot be able to pay off whatever she owes the creditors. Now, we also, uh, from the story, we see that both women are married. But for the first woman, she was married, but her husband is now dead. The second woman is married, and the only explanation we have about her husband is that her husband is old. Whatever that means, fill in the blanks for yourself, all right? We just saw that the dude is old, all right? When the Bible says you're old, you're old, all right? <laughs> old, man, the guy is old. So, but he, at least he's there. At least he's breathing, all right? At least he's breathing. And we shall say that in just a short while, all right? At least he's alive, all right? So the first woman, her husband is there. The second woman, the husband is... I mean, the first woman, the husband is dead. The second one, the husband is still, is still alive. Now, the first woman, going back to the first woman, the first woman has children. She has two sons. The second woman, we realize at the beginning of the story, she doesn't have any children. Did you notice that? She has no son. She doesn't have any, uh, any, any children. But the first woman, of course, is blessed with two sons. Both women interact uh, with prophet Elisha. That's something that is similar to both women. Both women receive miracles. Did you notice that? They receive a divine visitation. Both, of, both women are in need, and they need divine intervention. Even as we move along, you'll be able to see that and to appreciate that. So, now, uh, because we don't have a lot of time, this is one of those sermons you can preach for two or three hours, you know, but I know since you don't have that kind of time, uh, I will just try and encapsulate everything in the shortest time possible. Is that okay? So this is how I'm going to encapsulate it. I'm going to give you three capsules. One for the morning, one for lunch, one for evening. The first capsule is this. Are you with me? I hope you're writing. I hope you're taking notes. All right? Because I'll give you homework after this, so you might as well take notes. Okay, even if you're not taking notes, just pretend you're taking notes. Because pastor said you need to take, just pretend. You look at your neighbor, if they don't have a pen, just help them. So the first lesson that I want to just leave uh, to us, taken from this two stories. Are you ready? Yes. Is that looking at both stories and looking at both, both, both details, you cannot be too poor not to have anything, and you cannot be too wealthy not to need anything. Did you write that? That's what I'm telling you you need to write. You cannot be too poor not to need, not, not to have anything, and you cannot be too rich. You cannot be too wealthy not to need anything. Now, look at these two women. One is wealthy, one doesn't have anything to her name. But when the first woman, who is in trouble with the creditors, when the prophet, when she gives the prophet her story, and she, of course, cries to the prophet, prophet Elisha, the prophet throws back the responsibility to her, and he asks her, what is it 
you have? What do you have in your house? Did you notice that? And in response, she says, your servant has, what does your Bible say? Your servant has nothing except a little oil. As if the little oil is nothing. But she says that your servant has nothing except a little oil. And Elisha brings about a miracle, gives her instructions that will bring about her, her miracle using the little oil that is in her possession. Are you with me? In other words, friends, in God's grace and mercy, please hear me and hear me good. In his grace and mercy, there is nobody, none of us who are seated here, it doesn't matter how... Uh, how, how, how much of a difficult you find yourself in. Maybe you don't have any money, you've lost your job, you're in debt. But there is nobody who is ever too poor not to have anything. Are you with me? In other words, God will never allow you to be so impo impoverished that you have absolutely nothing. You may not have money, but you have a brain. Well, at least we assume. You may not have a lot of money, but you may have education. Yes. Have you noticed that there are people who don't have anything, but they are as strong as an ox? I mean, this guy will live on Ugali and Sukumawiki one meal a day for years, for generations, and yet he will live to be a hundred. Come on, talk to me, people. Whenever he goes to the doctor, he has no issues with cholesterol. Absolutely none. He never even suffers a headache, not a flu. Yet when you look at his meal, it is not even balanced. He's a sukumawiki and ugali. Yet we also have people who can afford sausages and bacon and chips and all those kind of things. Yet their biggest problem is cholesterol. Every time they go to a doctor, you're being told to lay off this, lay off that, lay off the other. And you begin to realize that at the end of the day, none of us can be too poor not to have anything. Are you, are you with me? Isn't that the paradox of life? Yet also, on the other hand, none of us can be too rich to, not to need anything. I promise you there are things, it doesn't matter whether you, you, you have billions and billions and you own this and you own that and you have a lot of power. There's always something that will bring you to your knees. Have you met people who are so wealthy and they could give everything they own on planet Earth if only they could have good health? Because there are things that money cannot buy. There are things your power cannot give you. There are things that you know you cannot do for yourself. There are things that will always bring you to your knees. And I like using this example. If you are flying, it will not matter whether you're flying first class or you're flying economy with the rest of us. When you hit turbulence, it feels the same everywhere. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? Turbulence is a great equalizer. <laughs> and I normally say this when you're flying and you hit turbulence there is no atheist in there there is no Muslim in there there is no Buddhist everybody that particular time whether you believed whether you have ever prayed I'm telling you when you hit turbulence everybody is praying they may not pray loudly I'm telling you they are praying it's usually a wonderful opportunity to give an altar call <laughs> remember once we were just coming in I was coming from Florida in the U.S., and we're just coming into North, uh, North Carolina and Charlotte. And as we're just coming into the city, there was this storm that was just coming into the city. In fact, later, because I was doing a connecting flight there, we, we, we remained, you know, on the, on, the, on the ground. You know, we boarded the, the aircraft, but the, the whole airport just shut down. And I, I was, you know, we just remained on the tarmac for about three hours. But before we landed, we knew we were in trouble. At one point, we hit an air pocket, and the, and the plane that we were in, I mean, literally dropped a few hundred feet, literally. Have you ever felt your stomach in your mouth? <laughs> Suddenly, your life flashes in front of you. Let me tell you, at that moment, whether you're in economy, whether you're, whether you're in the cockpit, whether, whether you're, 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 you're in first class, it doesn't matter. Are you hearing me? Life is like that, my friends. You can never be too wealthy not to need anything. 
The second woman was a woman of means, a Shunammite woman. But there was something her money could not do for her. That is why prayer is not exclusively for poor people. Prayer is for every one of us. If you think you don't need anything, hold on. Something is going to hit you up. You will find yourself crying in the presence of the Lord. And that moment, it will not matter how much power you have. You will just know, Lord, I need you. So the first lesson, the first capsule was what? You can never be too poor not to have anything. And you can never be too wealthy not to need. In the spirit-filled abundant life, let me tell you, God has already given us gifts. He led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. Every one of us has something that God can use. It doesn't matter whether you're illiterate. You still have something that God can use. Come on, turn to your neighbor and tell them there's something that God can use in you. There's something inside of you. He, do you know that God, God, if you can put it this way, and I'm not doing this in, in a disrespectful way, you know God is, a, is in business? He puts investments in every one of us. And when we stand before him, he's going to call forth for a return on everything that he's placed in. You will never be able to stand before God's, God's throne and say, Lord, me, I was too poor. He will say, I put something inside of you. There is something that is inside of every last one of us. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I need to leave with us is this, that God honors those who honor him. And I'll show you that in just a short while. God honors those who honor him. Uh, and that particular verse from 1 Samuel, I believe, is it in chapter 2 or chapter 20? But God honors those who honor him. And those who despise him, he treats with contempt. Are you with me? In other words, when you honor God, he will honor you back. When you honor him with your life, he will honor you back. Now, I want you to look at the conversation this woman has with Elisha, the first woman. Look at the conversation she has with him. Please, are you following with me? Are you, if you're following, please, just, I always like knowing that my students are following me, all right? Children, are you following with me? Yeah, yeah they are there also, all right? Now, Notice, she goes to Elisha. Remember, she's in trouble. N look at the conversation she goes to him. She goes and tells him, your servant, are you there? My husband is dead. And then she says, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take away my two sons. Now, notice the beginning again there. It's very easy to miss it. She says, Mr. Elisha, Prophet Elisha, Reverend Elisha. Your servant, because her husband, by the way, was of the school of prophets, and uh, Elisha was also part of the school of the prophets. So she comes and she tells, now, there's no better way of getting somebody's attention, all right, by telling them, you tell them, your servant, so that Elisha knows who she's talking about. Of course, he's aware that the, the, the husband is dead, but she comes and says, your servant but then she also puts another connector there and says, my husband. Are you getting this? Your servant, my husband, is dead. And then she says, and you know that he was a man who feared the Lord. He had a relationship. He was a man who honored the Lord, if you can put it in another, in another way. And Elisha acts on that word. Now notice, she doesn't come there. She doesn't even begin saying how much she's in trouble. Oh, in fact, this man died. Oh, my husband died. She comes and uses, she's very skillful in how she approaches this. She says, your husband, uh, I mean, your, your servant, my husband is dead. In other words, what she's doing, are you ready for this? This is what she's doing. She is claiming something here. She's saying, because my husband, who was or who was the father of my two sons, because he was a righteous man, because he served you, because he served God, based on that, I am expecting a miracle. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So she's not saying because I'm righteous. She's saying, based on my husband who has served Jehovah, he was a school of the prophets, now my sons are in trouble, but because of his faithfulness, I am expecting that God will come through for him. Why? Because God honors those who honor him. Now understand this, understand this, that even in death, your works will follow you. 
We normally say that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. But hear me. Now, you're looking at me very strangely. See, when I serve the Lord, I've been preaching this gospel for a number of years now. Can I tell you, even when I am gone, my children will reap the benefits of my serving or of my honoring God even if my daughter doesn't want to be blessed, she has no choice. Even when I'm gone, are you hearing me? And her children's children, will be, it's called blessing by association. <laughs> Anybody who is connected with me, including my beautiful wife, There are things they never have to pray for. Oh my goodness. I wish I had some people of faith in here. There are things simply because this fellow is serving. Pastors, simply because we serve him. Simply because we all, he is no man's debtor. Even when we are gone, make no mistake about it. The enemy can kill me in the flesh, but he cannot take away my legacy. That is why as a parent, do I have some fathers in the house? That's why you need to honor the Lord. Stop honoring Manu and Chelsea. Manu and Chelsea will come and go. It will not help your children. When they're in trouble, they will not pray to Chelsea. They will not pray to Manu. Or us and all, the losers. Anyway, that's another story for another day. You see, now I have your attention. All this time you were quiet until I mentioned. <laughs> but when you honor him, my God, it is better than any insurance policy. Because my children and my children's children, to the third and the fourth and the fifth generation, will always know there was somebody in our lineage who honored God. That is why I, and I'll tell you, especially as parents, I know some of us, unfortunately, the only time your children see, see you so animated, the only time they see you punching the air and getting excited and shouting at the top of your voice is when Manu is playing. Okay, or, or Chelsea. Okay, then for us and also. <laughs> That's the only time. So you know what? Your children watch you. When you come to church, you are nice, calm, cool, and cool. In fact, you even come to church late. When pastor goes beyond time, you start complaining. But when you go home, you come alive. When Chelsea's playing. You know what you're doing to your children? You're teaching them that that is what is important. But God is not important. Let your children see you get animated. In the presence of the Lord. Some things are best caught, not taught. Let your children see you pray. If you want, to, if you want them to pray, let them see you pray. If you want to see them worship, let them see you worship. My goodness. God honors. Look at this woman. I mean, look at that prayer. Look at that prayer comes and says, your servant. But she doesn't stop there. He was your husband, but to me, he was my hubby. And because he was my hubby, he was a father of my children. And because he honored God, if not for anything else, because of his labors, let his labors follow him. He may be gone, but the Lord that he served is still Alive. Look at the second woman. Look at her. Remember, God honors those who honor him. So this woman, the Bible says, that she met Elisha. Then she invited him over to her house. And so whenever the man of God came to town, you know, an itinerant minister is a prophet moving from place to place, she would invite him, come and have a meal. And the man would come, have a meal. And then one day she somehow, the Bible says, she perceived, 
all right, that he was a prophet. He was a man of God. He was God's servant. So she went and told her husband and said, let's do something about this. Now, because they are people of means, they used what they had. So she went and said, let's build for this man. Notice, let's build for him. Now, some versions say an upper chamber. Others, I like the version, King James, it says an upper room. Are you with me? An upper room. And we're coming to that whole notion of the upper room. It says, let's build for him. So that whenever he comes to town, he will have somewhere he can come and rest. So they put in a bed in there. They put a chair, a table, and a lamb. So they built, and the man of God will come to town. So, of course, you know the story. So one day the man of God comes and says, oh, uh, what can we do for this lady? And, of course, she says me, there's nothing else that I need. All right? Just cutting the long story short. And then one thing leads to another. She becomes pregnant, of course, by, through the word of the prophet. And then one day her son goes out into the field. And the Bible says he's out in the field with his father and the reapers. Which means, by the way, remember types, types and pictures in the Old Testament. Remember what I taught you, that every New Testament principle, there's an Old Testament picture. Now notice, the Bible says that she's out in the field with her father and with the reapers. Reapers will only show up during a time of harvest. Are you with me? And a time of harvest basically also connotes a time of a move of the Holy Spirit. All right, so she's out there, in the, he's out there in the field, and then the Bible says, of course, that uh, he got a headache, and then the father, the old man, what did he do? He said, take him to his mother. <laughs> Very African. <laughs> Have you noticed how when the children are not doing too well? They're like, yeah, mama. <laughs> but when your child is number one in school, <laughs> my son. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever noticed? Have you ever noticed, I don't know about you, but you have you ever noticed that our parents, none of them, especially our fathers, none of them were ever number last in class. Was, you know, when I was your age, I used to be, I used to lead the class. I was a near student. Won't go. You know, <laughs> another story. <laughs> Anyhow, story for another day. But notice, so he says, take him to, this, to his mother. Now, when the boy is brought back to his mother, what does she do? The Bible says that the boy lay in her lap until he died. Then what did she do? She picks the boy, takes him to the upper room. Stay with me. The same room that she had built for the prophet. She takes him to the upper room, lays him on Elisha's bed. All right? Because, here is a little principle right there, what she thought she was doing simply for the man of God, she didn't realize this little chamber that she was building will be the very thing that she will need herself. <laughs> In other words, friends, when we honor God, when we grab at the opportunities to serve him, sometimes we think we're just doing service to him. Sometimes we don't think it really matters. But there is a day that is coming. The little thing that you built, which you did not maybe sometimes put too much thought on, will be the very thing that God will use to bring a miracle in your life. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, imagine having a conversation with that woman later. Do you think it really mattered how much she used to build that little thing? Do you think it, that was even a conversation? I am sure she was excited. She must have said, you know, thank God I built that upper room. Thank God I honored him. Because if I had not honored him, I would, have, I, would, I would have had to bury my son. But because I honored him, the thing that I honored him with is the very thing that he used to bring back my son to life. Because God honors those who honor. God is no man's debtor, friends. People, you can do things for people, they will forget. God never forgets. Come on, somebody in this place. You can be a blessing to somebody and even tomorrow they will even talk behind your back. But thanks be to God because there is a book in heaven. There is a book of records in heaven. He is recording everything that you may, it may seem insignificant for you. When you prayed for that brother, he's recording. 
when you did something to that person, he's recording. That money that you gave for that mission, he's actually, there's a book of remembrance. And let me tell you, one of these fine days, you will need that book of remembrance to be opened in heaven. And when your time of blessing comes, when your time of tribulation comes, all they will have to the angels will just go back to the books. They will open up and they will see that thing that you did. You forgot about it, but because you honored him, because you, you, you blessed him, because you served him, he will do it for you in the name of Jesus. I'll never forget some years ago, and I remember I, was, I needed to pay some, some things. I needed to, you know, and you know, one of those times when you need a lot of money. Okay, I know that's about all the time, but one of those special times, you need a lot of money, and, and you don't know what to do. And you're stuck. And, and I remember I woke up in the morning, it was just at the beginning of the week, and I said, Lord, I don't know how to pay. I needed to pay some, some, some obligations. And I didn't know what to do. And I said, Lord, I, I, need, I, need, I need some money. I need this. I don't know how it's going to happen. Um, and, 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 you know, I just left it at that. You know, I remember later that day, I, I get this phone call. And, and they tell me, by the way, there was this particular conference that was going on in town, somewhere in town. And they call me and they say, by the way, um, there's this uh, conference that is happening. We want you to come and speak on a Wednesday. I remember it was on a Wednesday, lunch hour. Can you imagine lunch hour? All right? Just, you know, come, just a very, very short service, just come and speak and, and what have you. So I just said, and of course, this is a short notice because the person who was supposed to preach had been bereaved and was not able to come. So they just said, just come. Let me tell you, let me tell you, some people, because some, especially for us, sometimes as pastors, men of God, sometimes we are so proud. We say, you know, you need to give me some good advance. You know, notice, you know, I'm a busy man. You know, let me tell you, sometimes you have to grab that opportunity when it comes because you never know. Thank God I told them I'm going to come. So I went preaching in this lunch hour. Do you know they came and gave me an envelope at the end of that, a substantial amount for a lunch hour meeting? It was exactly the amount. It was because when you honor him, when you honor him, he honors you. There are opportunities all around you. Have you ever sometimes prayed, maybe you are in need, you need a miracle, but the thing that, 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 uh, that, that presents itself before you is another need that you need to help somebody. Have you ever been in that place? You need money and somebody comes asking you for money. Anybody ever gone through that? And sometimes, of course, we get angry. We say, Kwani, God, you didn't understand my prayer. <laughs> like I said, I need money. I didn't ask you to send someone to come and ask you for money. Sometimes what you don't know is that that is an opportunity to sow into somebody's life, to bless somebody. Because how many of you know it is more blessed to give than to receive? Sometimes as I meet your need, as I refresh your need, God is working out something in heaven. Are you hearing what I'm saying? See, this is what Jesus said. He said, if you welcome a prophet in the name of a prophet, he said you will receive a prophet's reward. This woman received a prophet's reward. No wonder the man of God couldn't wait to bless her. Even when he sent a word and said, Jehaz, please find out. And she said, me, I'm with my own people. I don't need you to do anything for me. But he said, no, 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 no. We have to do something for this woman. Do you know that that child that she received was literally forced on her? Oh my. Sometimes we are praying for children. Can you imagine God forcing a miracle on you? He just comes, he doesn't ask you for your opinion, whether you believe, whether you like it. He just said, I know you don't have a child. Next, this time, next year, same time, you will carry a child. She even protests. Don't raise my hopes. Yeah. But how many of you know when God decides he's going to bless you, he won't even ask you for your opinion. Yeah. Oh my. Finally, so that was second capsule, third capsule. Can I give you this last one for a full dosage? <laughs> so what was the first one? Yeah, yeah, that one. Number two. <laughs> Number three, God is a generational God. And I want to show you this and then we'll be done for the day. Is that okay? God is a generational God. God works in generations. God's paradigm is generations. God is not just about me as an individual. God is about the generations that even come after me. That is why God blesses us with children. Now, for this first woman, notice, she has two sons. But I want you to notice something that is very interesting. When she goes to Elisha, and, uh, and of course she needs a miracle, her, her 
primary concern is not so much the creditors, is not so much what she owes to the creditors, it is so much the consequence of this debt. Are you with me? So what is the consequence of the debt? Her sons will be enslaved. Are you with me? All right? That's the consequence of this debt. In fact, if it was just about the debt, that would not probably be such a big deal. But the fact that her children will become slaves is what is concerning her. I suggest to you, how many parents do we have here in this place? How many? You're a parent. All right? Mother, father, you're there. You're a parent. I suggest to you people that the creditors are still coming after our children. They want to enslave them in addictions, they want to enslave them in sin. They want to enslave them in immorality. They want to enslave them in drugs and all kinds of things. Are you with me? The creditors, please tell your neighbor, the creditors are still coming. The one who reaps where he has not sown. The enemy of our souls. Our creditor, because we owed a debt, we could not pay. He is after our children. If he cannot get you, he is after your child. He is after your son. He is after your daughter. And he wants to enslave them. But I want you to notice the instructions. Now, Elisha could have given any kind of instructions to this woman for her to receive her miracle. But the choice of the instructions is very telling for you and I when we think of the word as types. Especially because of the New Testament. Now notice, he asks her, what is it you have in your house? She says, I have nothing except a what? A little oil. Now in the Bible, how many of you know that oil in the Bible is usually symbolic or a type of the Holy Spirit? Are you with me? So he says, she, she tells, uh, he, he tells her, rather, he tells her, now God... She says, I have this little oil. That's, what he, that's, that's where the miracle is going to come from. So the instructions are this. Go and gather. Are you ready for this? Go and gather empty vessels. Now I like the King James on this. Go and gather empty vessels and not just a few. In other words, the size of this miracle is dependent on you. As many vessels as you bring, that's what will determine the amount of oil <laughs> you will receive. All right? So bring not just a few. So she goes and gathers from her neighbors everywhere all the vessels she could gather. All right? Brings them into the house. Now, I want you to understand something. See, God sometimes will put us in a very controversial position. Can you imagine? This woman has just lost her husband. Now she's going borrowing vessels. Now, you know vessels? Yeah. You know, mitungi. And I know some of you have them in your house because of water. Water issues. All right? You know those, those little whatevers that you have? Those jerrycans and stuff? Can you imagine what the neighbors will be saying? She's lost it. She did not empire. Come on, talk to me. Is that how we talk? She's lost it. Then the man of God tells her, once you, get, once you gather the vessels, it says, shut the door. Now hear, you, hear this. This is where we miss. Shut the door behind you and your sons. Are you with me? In other words, lock yourselves in, you and your sons. Because this miracle, <laughs> this provision will need two generations to cooperate. Mother and sons must come together. Are you with me? And then once you have shut in yourself, begin pouring into the vessels. All right? So she begins pouring, but the more she poured the more there was oil. Yes. All right? Then, after they had poured in and poured in, then at the end of it, and guess who is bringing the, 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 the vessels? Who is bringing the vessels? The sons. Mother is probably holding the little, whatever oil she had, 
but it's the sons. Then, when they had filled everything, if she asks the son, says, bring me another one. And she says, and the boy says, there's none that is left. Then what the Bible says? He says, then the oil stopped. Are you with me? Oil being symbolic of the Holy Spirit means that the flow of the anointing, <laughs> are you with me? The flow of the anointing in our homes has to happen behind closed doors with our children. Are you with me? And as long as there's an empty vessel in your home. Now, Paul in Corinthians says that you and I are vessels. We are jars of clay. These children are empty vessels. As long as we begin pouring into them, the anointing will keep flowing. Are you with me? Now, these two boys, the, the threat on them was broken because the anointing breaks. <sighs> Deliverance for our children. Guess where it happens first? Behind closed doors. Oh, man. I just, are you with me? And as long as there are empty vessels, the oil will keep flowing. The anointing will keep flowing. And as long as I keep the anointing flowing in my home, then my son, my daughter, I am sure that they will not be enslaved. Are you with me? I, it is not the responsibility of society or our school system to raise our children. It is the responsibility of fathers and mothers. Lock the door every day. Let the anointing flow in your home. There has to be an anointing in that home. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It is the responsibility of parents. You have to create that atmosphere in your home. You are the priest in that home. Let the anointing flow in that home through your hands whether your children like it whether they don't like it whether they get bored it is your job to lay hands on them it is your job to speak life to them it is your job to correct them it is your job to guide them it is your job to open the scriptures to read it to them let the anointing flow as long as there's an empty vessel in your home let the anointing flow We are losing our children to slavery. In fact, nowadays it's become very literal. We are losing our children to slavery in Arab countries. They're enslaving our children. But give us where the deliverance is. Behind. Closed. Let me ask you, those two boys, after they saw that miracle, do you think their lives were impacted? Do you think they worshipped and they served God for the rest of their lives? I bet you. I bet you. Then after they had filled the last jar or the last vessel, this is what the instructions. Go and sell. Pay off your and live off. Can you, can you look at that miracle? She just wanted to pay off her debt. <laughs> because God is more than able. To do exceeding abundantly above all. But here is the key. Here is the key. Please hear me. Two generations. The generations in your home must come together. There must be a coming together. Are you hearing me? The second woman, and I'm just done with this. God is a God of generations. The second woman is a woman from Shunem. Notice for her she didn't have a son. The man of God, Elisha, of course, through his word, a son is born. In other words, for me, when I look at that story, it's like there was a generational gap. This woman was a righteous woman. But who would carry forth that righteousness to the next generation? So no wonder she received a son. Are you with me? Because how do we pass on a heritage of faith except through our children? 
So she got a son. But then I want you to notice. One day the son, of course, she bring up her son, and then one day the son is out in the field, and then the son, one thing leads to another, probably suffers a sunstroke out there, and the boy does what? Dies. Now, if you thought that the other woman was badly off, that the, the, the freedom of her children was being, was being threatened, this one is even worse. Her son died. Why? Because the enemy comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. But notice again what she does. Picks the boy, takes him where? Come on, say it with me. The disciples, 120 of them gathered in the book of Acts, were gathered where? In the upper room. Do you have an upper room in your life, friends? An upper room is that place where there is a Holy Spirit visitation, friends. Because there's nobody who can bring back our children to life except the Holy Spirit. Those who are in rebellion, there is nobody who can bring them back to life except the Holy Spirit. She takes him to the upper room. Where else could she have taken She doesn't take him to the hospital. She doesn't look for a counselor. She doesn't look for a teacher. She takes him to the upper room, places him in that upper room, goes and looks for the man of God. Now, I want you to look at the faith of this woman. Look at the righteousness of this woman. She goes back to where it all began. See, because anything that is, is birthed in prayer must be sustained by prayer. Come on, hear me and hear me. This is going to be worth your lunch hour. Are you with me? As you're having that bugger, you'll remember this word. Hear me, hear me. Anything and everything that is birthed on your knees... It must be sustained on your knees. Listen, in life, anything you have to manipulate to get, you'll have to manipulate to keep. Everything you have to fight people to get, you'll have to keep fighting to keep it. If you have to sleep around to get a promotion, you'll have to keep sleeping around to keep that promotion. But thanks be to God, there are some of us who say, I will wait on the Lord, I will wait on my knees, because what God gives me, I don't have to fight to keep, what God gives me, I don't have to manipulate to keep. All I have to do is still go back to the source. Lord, you gave me this job. You're the one who's going to keep me in this job. You gave me this business. Lord, this business depends on you. I am not going to fight anybody. I'm not going to try anything. Because it's never by might. It's not by power. It is by the spirit of the living God. This woman understood that principle. So she said, I am going back to the source. It was that man of God. It was a prophet. It was Elisha. He's the one who prophesied. This child is a child of promise. I am not going to, to the hospital. I'm going to anywhere. I'm not going to the morgue. I am going back to the man of God. So you know what she does? Lays her hand, lays her, 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 her son, of course, in the, in the upper room. Then she saddles her horse and she takes off and she goes to see the man of God. Now, I want you to see the faith of this woman. Are you still with me? Are you still tracking with me? Are you still seeing this woman somewhere in your visions? Can you see her? Now, as she's coming nearer, now, Elisha notices, oh, that is the Shunem, the woman from Shunem. She's coming, and he sends Jehazi. Go and find out. Is it well with your husband? Of course, he had to ask, start, ask, start with the husband. He was old, so we don't know. But <laughs> is it well with you, with your husband, even with your son? What does she say? King James. It says, what did she say? It is... A woman has just lost her son, her only son. She doesn't break down. I'm, oh, come on, people. She just says, is it well? It is well. Why? Because as long as it is Jehazi who is asking. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Listen, you have to be careful. Who you share your issues. Some of us, you've been talking to Jehazi. <laughs> oh my. I, I, oh Lord. Lord help them to understand this. As long as it's Jehazi who is asking, there's only one answer. It is well. In fact, look at Jehazi. Well, Elijah tells Jehazi, please run. If anybody greets you, don't, don't even say hi to them. Just run. Here is my staff. Jehazi goes before them, comes to this boy lying there, comes and whatever he does with the staff, and then a few moments later comes back and says, I, he's still dead. <laughs> Small wonder. As long as it's Jehazi. Oh, come on, people. Let me tell you this, guys. As long as it is Jehazi, it is well. 
Okay, let me try the worship team here. As long as it's Jehazi, it is well. Because Jehazi will not help you. Please stop wasting your air time. Oh. Talking to people who can't help you. You're just giving them fodder for gossip. If they ask you, how is your marriage? <laughs> oh, yeah, he beat you last night. They ask you, how is it? Oh, it is well. It is well. How is your business? How is your child? Oh, yeah, in your back of your mind, you know that child is running off and is going crazy. But this is Jehazi. What has Jehazi got to do with me? It is well. That is faith. She said, this miracle did not begin with Jehazi. It began with the prophet. She says, I am not leaving you all. I am going with you. Right? I don't care whether you are eating. I don't care whether you have another appointment. You must come with me. So Elisha finally gets there. Of course, he received the first word. Oh, yeah, I've tried. It didn't work. Comes to the house. Look at what he does. Goes to the upper room. My God. My God. A place of visitation. Then what does he do? Shuts. Because there are some things that cannot happen in public. They're not for public consumption. He shuts the door behind him and the little boy. And then what does he do? He lays on the little boy mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. And notice the progression of this miracle. And then when he rises, of course when he's lying there, the Bible says... The boy's body started warming up. Notice, started warming up. Warmth started to build up. Elisha was a Pentecostal. That's what the Bible says, don't he? So the Bible says he paced up and down. Saying, You know, sometimes when you see people praying, like they've gone crazy, it's because of the things that are chasing them. So when you see them, it's not because you are crazy. And you know the Bible says that the Holy Spirit gives us that prayer language. He groans in us with words that cannot even be uttered because sometimes some things must be, must be connected in the spirit. So he goes, paces up and then the boy is still lying. He's warm. But he's still dead. Yeah. My goodness. He's warm. <sighs> That's why you need to pray yeah. until the breakthrough. Sometimes we quit too early. Yeah. See, when you're praying for that husband who is not born again, okay, now you come and give a testimony and say, oh, yeah, he used to drink, to drink every night. Now he's only drinking once. He used to smoke 20 packets of cigarettes. Now he's only smoking one. Listen, can I help you? Yeah. It just means he's warm. Yeah. <laughs> he's still dead. Yeah. So it is your job, yeah. like Elisha, this is what you need to do. You have to keep doing that. Then what does Elisha do? He goes back, lies on the boy again. And then, achoo! Yeah. <laughs> Come on, try with me. Achoo! Achoo. How many times? Seven. Seven is a number of completion. Amen. Because God never starts anything he, can, he does not finish. The boy sneezed. Let out air. For those of you who are doctors, you know, sneezing is... Is what? When there's that irritation and you let out a lot of air through your nostrils and your mouth. Do you not know that in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, the same word for air is the word ruach, which means wind and is also translated spirit. It's the same thing also in the New Testament. The word pneuma is also translated as wind, like on the day of Pentecost, uh, a strong mighty wind, a strong mighty pneuma. 
filled the room. Same word that is also translated spirit. In other words, friends, this boy sneezed until there is breath. Oh my goodness. Until there is the spirit of God, our children are not alive yet. Until they are filled with the Holy Spirit, we must study in that place until our children begin speaking in tongues. Until they are born again. Not of flesh and blood, but by the spirit of the living God. Until they begin sneezing. Can I ask us to all rise up on our feet as we come to the end of this service? Actually, can we do something before we go? Is that okay? Can I ask all the boys and girls? This next generation. Can I ask all the boys and girls, please come here to the altar. Pastor Gadesha, please help me with these boys and girls. Let them come to the altar. All the if you have a boy and girl, by the way, as a parent, if you want to bring them to the altar, just bring them right now. Can we do some things right now? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, if you, please, as a parent, mother, father, if you have your child with you, bring them to come with them to the altar. Come with them. Come with them. Come with them. I know there are many, but it's all good. We'll try as much as possible to just feed them all these in, in this altar. And I'm going to ask our elders, our pastors, who are here, heads of departments, we were with them yesterday. You're going to come, and you know what you're going to do? I want us to lay our hands on these little ones. I want us to bless them. I want us to claim every one of them in the name of Jesus. Are you hearing me? And I want us to claim them. None of them will be enslaved in Jesus' name. None of them will die before they get to their destiny in the name of Jesus. Do I have some people of faith, some people who are agreeing with me? Come on, just lift up your hand if you agree with me. We want to claim every one of these little ones in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Listen, they may not understand a whole lot of things in the church or even what is happening right now. But I tell you one day, they'll remember that somebody laid hands on them. Can I tell you this as you're making your way? You know I love stories. Can I give you another story? <laughs> Nobody even said yes, but I'll give you anyway, even if you don't want to know. You know, my dad, my dad, um, I was born into a, a home of a pastor, a man of God. My, man, my, my, my dad was a man of faith. My mom, the same thing. So me, we were born in church, basically. In my father's house, when Sunday reached, everybody went to church. If cats and dogs could be saved, they would have also come to church, I tell you. <laughs> there was no excuse. But the one thing that I'll never forget, as long as I live, is the one time I was a little boy, a very little boy, and there was this visiting evangelist. He was a children's evangelist. I'll never forget this guy. Had a guitar. I don't know his name. I can't remember who, uh, even his face. But I'll just remember that this man had a passion for children. And the man came into town. And of course, he came to our church. You know, that time. And uh, so on the Sunday afternoon, after the service, they had invited all the children to come back for a children's rally. Ever heard of a children's rally? So all the children came. So my dad took me by the hand, went home for lunch, and we came back. And my dad came, and of course, they had removed all the chairs in the church. It was just a place like, so they had removed the chairs. They had just put carpets, so children would just sit down, and then this man would come and sing, and then he would share. Of course, he would share the gospel with, the, with, with us, boys and girls that time. So they had removed the chairs. So my dad, and I'll never forget this. Listen, especially for you who are fathers. Do I have a fathers in the house? My dad didn't send me to church. He did not send me to church. My dad brought me to church. Sat with me. All right? I remember I was with my brother. Sat with us in that carpet with us. He didn't send the house help to bring us. He didn't send the neighbor. He brought us and sat with us. Now, up to that particular point, I used to have a, a, a problem with one of my ears. And, and uh, I'd gone to the doctors and nobody could really figure it out. I used to really have a lot of pain 
in one of my years. For years, by the way, I was a little boy and they couldn't figure out what the problem was. So this man preached and of course, those of us, we made an altar call. Of course, you know the good thing about boys and girls is that when you make an altar call, they all get saved. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> then he, before he finished, he said, I want to pray for any of you, boys and girls, maybe you've not been well, you have a sickness, something is disturbing you and what have you. So my dad told me, please go. Are you with me? He encouraged me and said, please go and get prayed for. And I remember the man laid hands on us and prayed for healing. A little boy, I'm, I don't know much. But I kid you not, that was the last time I remember that my ear ever gave me problems. God healed me instantly. What am I saying, friends? Listen, church, listen. Are you hearing me? I'm passionate. I used to be a children's pastor. I've done youth ministry. I am passionate about the next generation. And I'm afraid. I'm afraid. We are pushing them away. I'm afraid, I'm afraid we are delegating that responsibility to other people, to pastors, to anybody else. We don't want to pray with them. We don't want to, we don't want to fellowship with them. I'm afraid we are losing our young people. It's our responsibility to bring them. That's why I was saying, if you are a parent, bring them here. They may not understand a whole lot of things. But let me tell you this. God never forgets. You know, my dad died more than 10 years ago now. But I, I have never forgotten that one incident. That one thing that he did for me. And I keep saying, maybe today I'm a pastor because... My dad, my dad took the time. Pastor White used to say, these are bundles of destiny. This, every one of them, is a destiny. Can I ask pastors, elders, those of you who are there, I want us to just, I know there are many, can we just, and even parents who are there, can we just pray for them just for a few minutes and then we are out of here? Is that Okay. Is that okay? So pastors, if you just weave your way around and the elders, those of you who are here, just let's just pray for them. If you're holding your child on this altar, I want us to declare that our children will not be enslaved in the name of Jesus. They will live and not die. They will live a long life. Come on church, stretch forth your hands towards them and just pray. Maybe your child is not here, it's fine, it's all good. Just pray for them. Let's bless them. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh Lord, hallelujah. Come. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, thank you for our children, oh Lord. Thank you for our boys and girls. Lord, we claim them for the kingdom. We claim them for the kingdom, oh Lord. In the name of Jesus, come on, speak a blessing over them. Speak a blessing over them. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, let's just bless them. Let's just bless them. Let's just bless them as we lay our hands on them. We bless them. We bless them. We bless them. We bless them in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We bless these little boys and girls. Hallelujah. 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 Oh Lord, oh Lord, we bless them, we bless them, we bless them, we bless them, oh Lord. We bless them, we bless every last one of them. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Oh God, oh God, our children will serve you. Our children will live for you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we want to thank you for we want to thank you for these children, Lord. We embrace every last one of them. Lord, we bless them. We bless every last one of them. Father, you know them. You know the kind of families some of them come from. But Father, you have drawn them to yourself. You have brought them even to church. Oh, we ask, we ask for their lives. We pray, Lord, 
that these little ones will not be enslaved by the enemy in any way. We want to declare today that they will live and not die. They will live a long life. Lord, we pray for a godly generation out of these little ones. Lord, even our teenagers and our young people, Lord. Lord, we pray for them. We pray, we contend for them. And I pray for every parent in this house, Lord. Every mother, every father, Lord. Father, some who have been so disappointed, so discouraged because of the way their children have turned out. Father, we pray that in this season that we are praying and fasting, would you bring a turnaround in those homes in the name of Jesus. Oh, let the anointing flow in our homes, Lord. That anointing that destroys the yokes of the enemy, let it flow in our homes, we pray. Let it flow in our, in our houses, we pray, in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we know that you're more than able. Even those who have been enslaved by the enemy, Lord, we know you're able to set them free in the name of Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, children. We bless them. Come on, let's appreciate every boy and girl. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Hi. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's finish with uh, the words of the grace. I know time is well spent. Let's finish with the words of the grace. Turn to somebody as we finish with the words of the grace. And now may the grace and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now. Amen. And surely goodness shall follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Have a glorious week. We'll see you on Wednesday.